say somebody's coming from a standard American diet, transitioning to 80% beef plus, and taking on more of a carnivore-ish diet, classic thinking would say, okay, I'm not getting all that fiber from plants. I'm having more meat now. My microbiome, a lot of it is probably going to suffer. Take me through that process of, of weeks there, like you said, that transition phase, and what's happening in the microbiome? The food supply transiting through your elementary canal, through your colon, is where this microbiome largely get their food from. And your dietary makeup is what it is, you as a person, any person's. Therefore, the speciation, the prevalence, the peaceable arrangement of all sorts of different species of microbiota in your colon is based on that food supply. The ones that are getting what they need most prevail most. The ones that don't get the, what they want will exist in the background and be like the mammals were while, while the dinosaurs were around, for example. Um, and then you suddenly change your diet, let's say, overnight. Now, the bacteria and other small organisms that are expecting a certain makeup of food are not getting that. They're getting something completely different that's no good for them they will go to war with each other for the resources that exist such that they are. Some of them will encapsulate themselves and basically go into stasis until conditions improve. Some of them that don't encapsulate, instead of doing that, will eat into the wall of your colon and bury themselves in there. That tends to cause quite a bit of gut upset when beasties basically eat through the lining of your colon and reside in there for a bit. So it's the physical injury, the damage of that having occurred, the inflammatory immune response to that. And if you upset your, your colon in terms of the health of that tissue, that will affect your entire body because there are more nerve endings in your colon than there are anywhere else in your body outside of your brain. And it's it's an environment which has perhaps the most pervasive effect over a person's overall health status of any other factor. So it's something we need to, to jealously guard and protect. That's why I'm saying change your diet slowly. Let that microbiome adjust to the change in such a way as you're not going to precipitate that all in war that's going to destroy your gut function, sometimes for years, till we can get it back. Um, it's not something you want to go through if you can avoid it. And can you avoid it? Yes, by being a bit sensible. Okay, take me through the fiber piece. I know this is something you're anti, this whole movement currently where we need to eat a lot of different plants and get a lot of different fiber for the microbiome. Tie that in. So the exact requirement in dietary terms, nutrient terms, for dietary insoluble plant fiber is not one single gram ever, ever. The so-called um, educated will then say, ah, yes, but there are a whole bunch of beasties that live in our microbiome that rely entirely on fiber. What they do is they basically ferment some of the fiber that you consume and in so doing release some short chain fatty acid and that short chain fatty acid is crucial for the functioning of your enteric cells in your colon, the cells that line your colon wall. And if you don't eat the fiber, these cells will be dysfunctional and there'll be a problem and you'll get bowel cancer and all of this kind of nonsense. When you actually then analyze that statement, it sounds feasible, doesn't it? It's like, oh, well, okay, that makes sense. Until you look at this thing and go, okay, well, the short-chain fatty acid that we're talking about, it's being released by the fermentation of a very small amount of the fiber that we actually eat. What is that short-chain fatty acid? Do you know, Jesse? 
I just know it as a short chain fatty acid. I'll give you the name. I don't. Of it. Yeah, just nothing further. I'll give you the name of the the major form of short chain fatty acid produced in your colon by fermenting fiber. It's called butyric acid. B U T R. I can't even spell it. butyric acid. <laughs> um, it's the same acid that you'll find in butter. Hence, butter is called butter, butyric acid. Okay. It's also the same fatty acid that you'll find provided on the other side of the lumen by ketone bodies, beta hydroxybutyrate. And in fact, if you take up butyric acid on the lumen side of the colon from fermentation of fibers or from butter, that butyric acid that you consume, the first metabolic step in making it useful so that we can use it for anything is to transmute it into beta-hydroxybutyrate, a ketone body. So this requirement for fiber for butyric acid, no, either eat butter or be in ketosis or both. Problem solved. I've eaten ostensibly no fiber to speak of for about nine years now. So I should be well and truly stopped up and I should be absolutely full of colon cancer by now, shouldn't I? After nine years of ignoring this fact that we all need fiber, hasn't happened. So either I'm some kind of superhuman as well as the hundreds of thousands and now probably millions it seems of people following this lifestyle, the carnival lifestyle, not one of them is running around saying, oh, it's terrible. I, I died within months, they say. They don't because they haven't. <laughs> so it's just it's an idea that's had its time. It's a hypothesis that is being offered up to people as a fact, and it's not a fact. It's a theory. It's an ideology. It's a theology. It's false. You don't need any fiber at all. In fact, fiber is, if anything, disruptive to enteric function. Uh, fiber is actually the cause of most issues that people have in their guts, precisely because your gut is not designed to break down fibers. Your gut is designed to absorb amino acids and fatty acids, some sugars. So as somebody is going through this transition period and including more meat, less fiber, Talk more specifically about what they can expect with bowel movements. Mm. Not that it's necessarily a problem, but are there changes that they should know? Yeah. There's quite a range of how people can react during the transition period. Some people will get transiently stopped up. They'll get constipated for maybe a week or two, which is reversible if needs be. There are steps we can take to get things moving if we have to. Sometimes they'll get loose, so the exact opposite. It just depends on what's happening in their microbiome, how it's reacting to it, and how those microbiota are dealing with their stuff to come to a new, peaceable, happy arrangement. Um, some people will notice absolutely nothing in terms of their bowel function. However, maybe they get skin breakouts. Maybe they get hair and nail issues for a month or two. Maybe they get brain fog. Maybe they get energetic issues. Maybe they get inflammatory issues around joints and things. All sorts, because anything whatsoever can happen in your body in response to something perceived as negative happening in in the colon. So when when you sort of say, well, what can people expect? Well, anything. To be fair, what we do find universally is the way to minimise any diversion away from ideal function, happiness, and health, even for a short period, is, as I say, to do this transition of changing your food across slowly, six weeks minimum. And then there'll be the person who changes their diet overnight, says, oh, it was fantastic, everything came right within a week, and I had no problems whatsoever, to which we say, well, congratulations, you're a superhuman. Most people have issues. And then for most people, when they get to the end of that six weeks and they've transitioned, can they expect 
regular bowel movements or will it be less frequent without plants? Absolutely. Um, we find that volume goes down of number twos. So they get skinnier, they get smaller, there's less of them. Instead of going once a day, sometimes more than once a day for some people, you'll find once every second or third day is quite normal. That's not to say still continuing to go every day is abnormal because now after, well, really nine, just over nine years, I'm regular to the point of once a day, every day, set your clock to it, one and done, no stress, no strain, no pushing, no difficulty of any kind, lay a rope, we're out of here within several minutes. Sorry for the details, but that's what we're talking about. Absolutely no issue with bowel function whatsoever. On a zero carbohydrate, basically, zero fiber, basically, diet. Tell you what, though, when I do go off piste because I'm a human being and do something stupid, that's when the bowel function falls to bits again for a day or two. And I go, oh, well, that's probably because I had that X, Y, or Z. What would it be for you when you do fall off track? I'm quite partial to beer. Um, I don't mind a potato chip. Um, occasionally, I've been known to do something as crazy as eat a small amount of pizza or something like that. And I'm pretty good these days, though. Mostly because the longer you're actually on a clean, 100% carnival diet, the more violently your body reacts when you do go off piste. So it becomes just not even worth it. And a lot of people think, well, that, if, if that's the problem with it then. You don't have that flexibility anymore. And I say, well, you can see that as a problem, if you like, or you can actually look at it as a bonus. You can say, you know, this is your body encouraging you very, very firmly to do the right thing consistently. That's maybe a good thing. Oh, yeah, but blah, 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 whatever, you know. And it comes down to this thing I often say to people, which is you need to understand the reason that you eat food is so that you might live. It is not the other way around. You know, a bit of discipline is all it takes. Until your body gets used to that, then it's quite happy with that. You go off piste and it goes, don't do that, Charlie Brown. I think it's a good thing. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. Insulin resistance is a normal, natural, indicated, and useful biological process. It is not a pathology, and it is not the cause of diabetes. The diet that these so-called scientists...